happily. I'm happy to introduce Jonathan Wiesen. He's the professor of history and department chair and distinguished teacher at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, at Birmingham. He did his undergraduate work in history at the University of California at Berkeley and the University of Sussex. And he received his PhD in history from Brown University. Before coming to UAB, he was the visiting assistant professor at Colgate University and distinguished professor and chair at Southern Illinois University. He is the author of West German Industry and the Challenge of the Nazi Past, 1945 to 1955, which won a book prize. He has written articles on historical memory, transatlantic relations, racism and the Holocaust, and anti-Semitism in modern Germany. He could, I could go on and on. He's published many things, but I want him to tell us about his work. And today's topic is studying Nazi Germany in the 21st century, opportunities and challenges. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you, Dr. Jonathan Wiesen. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Marsha. Can you yeah, so I'm gonna mute everybody and um as people come in so uh, marcia can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay very good well thank you so much marcia for this invitation i'm really happy to do this when i met you last year it looked it was sort of a different universe in some ways but i'm really glad that we can make this happen through zoom just a few things i'm used to this is still new for me and it's fairly new i've lectured to my classes on zoom but i'm sort of by definition the kind of person who likes to stand and posture and and paste. So we'll see how it all works out here, but I'm really happy to speak to you. And I got a chance to look at your, uh, your programming for this year, which is really fantastic, covering every imaginable field. So it's, it's just an exciting opportunity. And even more interesting for me is that uh, most of you know about this period somewhat, so I don't have to encounter people who say, what was World War II? And, but you never know. In any case, let me get started by uh, saying that today I want to reflect on uh, my area of research, as Marsha mentioned, uh, and I'm going to be pausing a little to admit people. So if it looks like I'm sort of moving away, it's because people are still joining us. So I'm multitasking. But Nazi Germany and the Holocaust are my areas of research. Um, and here I want to think out loud a bit for about 45 minutes uh, about where we are in the study of this period, 21st century two. Uh, as we move into the second, the third decade of the 21st century, what is there left to say about this period? What are the opportunities and challenges for the person interested in researching and studying Nazi Germany and its crimes? So these are the sort of uh, ways I'm going to approach this. Um, and my doorbell keeps ringing, so again, um, I'll, I'll roll with that. Okay, so I think in some ways this is a very opportune time to study uh, Nazi Germany now. In many ways, it often it always is because we come across horrible anniversaries. In this case, of course, it's the just uh, just beyond the seventy fifth anniversary of the end of World War II. So, obviously, some of the images of this period are more familiar uh, to some of you than others. But just moving, I'm just going to get to my PowerPoint here, and. This is just a simple image from 75 years ago of the surrender of the Germans uh, to the Allies, the unconditional surrender. Hitler, as you know, had launched a massive war of aggression, which resulted in the deaths of upward of 60 million people, among them 11 million Poles, uh, Russians, communists, socialists, homosexuals, Roma or gypsies, as they used to be known, Jehovah's Witnesses, and most notably, uh, six million Jews. Now, growing up, and I'm, I, and I'm sure the same with most of you, took it for granted that World War II and Hitler's crimes were the defining events of the last century, if not world history. It was always part of my young conscience and a collective conscience of post-war generations, these crimes of National Socialism. And Hitler 
himself was the pinnacle, uh, I would argue, of a century that started off rather hopefully and went off the rails fairly quickly. So if you look at publications in the year 1900, you see all sorts of mostly positive uh, predictions of how the century might go, a century of uh, medical, uh, medical findings and uh, technology. But World War I began what some have called the 30 Years War in Europe, which ended in 1945. Optimism gave way to a world war and Hitler was an outgrowth of Germany's loss in that war. So Nazi crimes are so vast that they've entered inevitably all forms of cultural production. So novels, poems, art installations, blockbuster films, philosophers have written about it, Bob Dylan sang about it, TV shows like Hogan's Heroes, which my students don't remember, but we remember, and movies and Broadway shows like The Producers poked fun at it, the History Channel, built its programming around Nazi Germany to the point where just about everybody called it for a while the Hitler Channel instead of the History Channel. Now you have some aliens and Elvis thrown in there. Uh, so there seems to be no end to the proliferation of studies on this period. So just in the last five years, for example, if you go to the uh, Library of Congress, you'll note 3,224 English language uh, books on the Nazi period alone. Uh, these do not include foreign languages, everything from Czech to Slovakian to German, of course. Uh, the only person written about uh, more, the, uh, Hitler, uh, actually, Hitler is, uh, if you Google Hitler, you get about 125 million hits uh, and the only person written about more because of time is historical figures are Napoleon and Jesus. So Hitler in the hundred, in the 75 years since the collapse of uh, Germany has occupied the third rank in terms of figures in German history that people have studied and written about. So given the ever present nature, the ubiquity of the Third Reich, we should probably not worry that attention is going to die out soon. But yet there is still this fear among historians of Germany that the lessons of this awful period will not remain obvious to future generations. So uh, will, one of the questions that's asked, will the Nazi period pass into history like another event, whether it be the Napoleonic Wars, whether it be uh, the, another bad guy, hit Genghis Khan, will Hitler sort of take on that um, that moniker of somebody long ago in the past who doesn't provide moral lessons to us anymore. Now, the fading of interest is inevitable and you can't fight against that, especially when survivors of the Nazi death camps and concentration camps are dying. So at the Auschwitz uh, uh, anniversary, January of this year on out the uh, 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, you had just a couple hundred survivors, most of them in their 90s and in their hundreds. Just 10 years ago, there were about 1,500 people. So it's really the case that in Germany, the youngest men and women who supported Nazism and perpetrated its crimes are uh, fading and passing away as well. So, and there is, of course, still, there are still trials going on. So in Germany, uh, for example, uh, just in July, a 93-year-old uh, man who had been a guard at the Stutthof concentration camp was uh, found guilty of accessory to 2,600 murders by being a guard there. He was uh, 17 years old at the time, but I'll say more about this at the end, why he, he was prosecuted, because Germans, the German judicial system didn't used to prosecute people simply for being there. But that gives you a sense of how these trials are still going on, though they're uh, winding down. So my question then is, how do you keep the legacy and lessons of national socialism or Nazism alive? You can keep 
posing historical and moral questions, you, you can still recognize the urgency they have. And yet what's interesting for me as a scholar of this period is the more we think we know, the more questions we ask. So one of the most common questions is simply the basic one, how could it happen? The it being a number of things, Nazism or the Holocaust, how could it happen? This is a question that is still asked even after all of these publications and books. And it's a, it's a question that is often accompanied by some version of it that takes into account the extremely educated nature of Nazi of Germany in 1933. So for example, um, you have, hold on one, oh, excuse me, sorry. I gotta let somebody in. Okay, so you have in 1933, a populace that was perhaps more educated than any other uh, population in the Western world, if not uh, globally. So then the question becomes often, how can the country of poets and thinkers and Einstein and other Nobel Prize winners descend into such barbarism? Let me show you a couple book covers, giving you an indication of how present this question still is 75 years after World War II. So here is a question, that, a book that came out just a couple of years ago called How, how Could This Happen? Surprisingly, and somewhat uh, on a lighthearted note, the question mark is missing. I have no idea why um, the publisher would leave the question out. It can't have been a mistake, or, or can have been, but this is a basic treatise. How could this happen? Or you can look at a very famous professor of the Holocaust, Peter Hayes, up at Northwestern University, a great historian who simply poses the question, why, explaining the Holocaust. Um, so what I want to do with this sort of broad why, how could it happen question still nagging us, I want to focus on a few, indicate a few areas where the research is going. Three general areas that are still receiving attention. Uh, they're not new questions, but they're still pressing. Um, the first one I would say is what you might call coercion, coercion versus consent. If you look at society from 1933 to 1945 in Germany, you see a population that either bought into Nazism or was coerced into following Nazism, according to the general sort of rough uh, schema. Now, of course, we know that hi hi history is much more complicated and people's, uh, people's sentiments are much more um, varied, but we have the common images that came out of World War II of this. 1933, the first arrests of political opponents. This is February already, a month after Hitler was sworn in as chancellor of Germany. Here we see the rounding up of communists. And this sort of sets the tone for both how Ger German, some people see it through Hollywood and other aspects, a police state, state terror administered from the top, fear, defining the life of those who were not captured, but feared they might be next. next. And there's certainly no uh, calling into question the absolutely uh, brutal state of the Third Reich early on as concentration camps like Dachau were just one of hundreds of camps set up in the year 1933, through which 300,000 people, at this point, mostly political prisoners, trade unionists, socialists, communists passed. So this is one image of coercion. But then we also know, uh, we students of history, see images like this. So this is a, a original color photo from 1938. This is not colorized. This shows the consensual aspect uh, or the euphoria, the fact that people were not necessarily forced into like people, like sort of hypnotized individuals forced into falling for propaganda and by virtue of it being a state defined in, by terror, forcing their arms in the air without enthusiasm. So this is not a stage photo. You see that it speaks to all generations, perhaps a young, uh, a, a young woman 
with her hand thrust in the air, an old gentleman on, the, on our right who may have been a monarchist supporting the, the Kaiser until the end of World War I when he was removed, and a sort of smug, happy young man in the front who is just taking it all in. No need to raise his hand. You can see on his face that he is deeply connected to the moment. So you'd think maybe this is a false dichotomy, coercion, consent, but interestingly enough, it comes up again and again, 85 years after, or 87 years after the founding of the Third Reich, because we see more and more documents. Diaries are discovered still. Uh, archives in Eastern Europe, which most people didn't have access to before the end of the Cold War, reveal things as mundane as how uh, regular people happily turned in over their neighbors. It shows a sort of life of joy and travel that is not as easy to reconcile with our sense of pure oppression. So that's one area, and again, we can turn into it to it in our discussion, but that's one area that uh, historians are looking at, coercion versus consent. Was this a popular dictatorship is another way of looking at it. A feel-good dictatorship, perhaps. The other area that we're still looking at is the perpetrator mindset. So we're still trying to figure out what uh, went on in the minds, not just of the leading perpetrators, Hitler, uh, SS leader Heinrich Himmler, the propaganda min minister Goebbels, but we're also trying to figure out what made your average guard at a concentration camp or at a death camp, what made him or her tick? Was he or she committed to the cause of racial purity or were they simply careerist? Were they forced to do their job? And here I wanna point out uh, the something, but before I do so, I actually wanna show you a, a slide I just recently noted actually relating to the other theme. This is a slide that gives you a sense again of perhaps the joy of Nazi imagery where as somebody might put a sticker on their car today, and they did that as well, you would put the signs of the new Nazi revolution on something as everyday and prosaic as a um, Kinderwagen, as they say in German, or uh, now I'm using the, like, um, yes, uh, a buggy, as they say in England. My, my brain is going into German now. Any case, some of you may know about this. I'm not, uh, just for the sake of sanity, I'm probably not going to um, take any questions now. I'd love to do it that way, but we'll talk about it more. This is from what's called the Auschwitz photo album. So about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. got a hold through a donation of a collection of photographs that they weren't, sh they weren't sure what they were. They were from a GI who had uh, been in Europe, an American soldier. And with great analysis, they looked closely, they recognized some of the people in it, and they discovered that this was in fact the photograph, a photo album kept by the second in command at Auschwitz. So we know perhaps of Dr. Mengele who received Jews and others at the ramps of Auschwitz and decided who would go to their deaths immediately and who would go into forced labor. But the second in command, also on the ramp, especially during 1944, a brutal summer of murder of Hungarian Jews, was a man named Karl Höcker. And what he did was he took photos of his life in the concentration, in the death camp of Auschwitz, in the labor camp. And in, in, in some cases, he went down to a spa linked to, in, on the Auschwitz uh, property, broadly speaking, the environs of, the, of Auschwitz. And he took photos of people who had, were taking a break from their daily duties. There is Karl Hooker on the left. Uh, he is relaxing with his family who came to visit him. So the perpetrators had family visit them by, by train, sealed train, and some other people relaxing. If you haven't seen this photo album, I can send you a link, but these are some other photos. These are young women working in the offices of Auschwitz, stenographers, teletype operators, uh, working in communications. These, this is a photo of a time uh, at Zollehütte, the spa. They're taking a little break. Um, 
and re they're relaxed. These are women who would record how many had arrived on a transport from all parts of Europe to the Auschwitz camp in Poland. They would record how many, perhaps how much gold was taken from Jews' mouths. They would record the number of people who were sent directly to gas chambers in Auschwitz. And they would call back or uh, they would uh, send back this information, keep the records. Who are these perpetrators? Are they zealots? Are they there for a good time? Are they human like us? These are what these kinds of uh, photographs show us. And there's just an astounding uh, reaction among students today, and not just students, but all of the people, including myself, regularly, when I see the sort of happy-go-lucky nature of this uh, life for these guards, who these women are just 20, 21, and how they sort of move along in their daily life of smiles and music, even as they sort of compart as they uh, compartmentalize what they're doing for just a moment and then go back to this sort of the drudgery of murder. So that's the second area that we're kind of deeply exploring because the perpetrators, we're trying to figure out how wide the net of perpetrators is. Who is a per perpetrator? Was Hitler a perpetrator? Yes. What about the per pencil pusher in the office, the Reich security office? Well, maybe if you see Nazi Germany as a totalitarian state, everybody, whoops, I have a uh, doorbell. Let me just make sure somebody can get in here. All right, Lynn Stafford. All right, so um, it, it, this becomes a question though, if everybody's a perpetrator, then nobody's guilty. Where do you draw the line? Or everybody's guilty, but what kind of guilt is that? So these are sort of the moral philosophical questions we're asking. There's a third area that I'll draw briefly into our orbit and then I'll go on to some of the things I'm doing and that's resistance and rescue. We are now, we're well aware of course that uh, there are many individuals and countries who went about rescuing Jews at risk to themselves for a long time after 1945, Germans would say sort of en masse, collectively, there was little we could do in a dictatorship. But now in Yad Vashem, the memorial to the uh, Jews who died in the Holocaust in Jerusalem, you can see tens of thousands, uh, well, I should say thousands of people who were honored for having risked their own lives to rescue Jews. Entire citizens of entire countries like Denmark, took the small number of Jews and helped ferry them to neutral Sweden. But then of course, the famous individuals whom some of you surely know, Raoul Wallenberg, a Swede who went down to Hungary in 1944 when the Nazis were uh, taking Jews from all over the Hungarian countryside. He issued protective passes under the gu guise of Swedish protection and saved countless Jews from being deported by declaring them essentially uh, Swedes temporarily. Okay, so these are just three rough areas. And there's, there's, of course, there's more that we can say, and I'll say more at the end about the Holocaust, maybe, for example, learning more about the community of Jews who fled to Japanese occupied Shanghai and grew up there. I myself have known some Jews who grew up in China or perhaps those Jews who were safe in Tehran. All of this is very new, fairly new material. Now, what I wanna do as I continue on is to show, say a little bit about uh, my own areas of research. And what I'm intrigued about really plays off of this question of normality or consensus in Nazi Germany. So, some people say that there was certainly a veil of normality, uh, that not all was horrible. Uh, my students still come into class believing that everybody was uh, seduced into supporting National Socialism. And my choices over the last uh, few, a decade or so, have been to look specifically at things related to the economy, the consumer economy, shopping, buying, selling, my first book, as Marcia kindly mentioned, had to do with corporate complicity, Nazis, um, 
made po companies that made poison gas, that took over Jewish businesses, that worked slave laborers to death, that dispossessed citizens from around Europe, that helped the Nazis engage in industrialized killing. These companies have had to explain themselves since 1945, and I have looked at these the PR efforts. But what about choices at the micro level? How have consumers, how did consumers who had to go to shops and make choices, um, often based on what the regime was telling them, uh, how did they respond? So here I look, have looked in a more recent book at the question of buying and selling in a setting where Jewish commerce was portrayed as evil. Jews as international bankers and string pullers and controllers of the economy, all the cliches that went back to the early modern period in the Middle Ages as Jews were forced into very narrow uh, professions like money lending. So here's a picture from April 1st, 1933. This is the, a boycott that was declared by Goebbels uh, just a few months after uh, Hitler came to power, presumably, in response, Hitler declares it in response to what he calls atrocity stories abroad. So Hitler claims that the Jewish press in the United States is saying, is lying by saying that people are persecuted in Germany, which of course they were to the tune of thousands, tens of thousands. And so as punishment, Jew, Germans were asked to blockade Jewish owned stores. So April 1st, uh, Deutsche wehr euch, kauf nicht bei Juden, Germans, protect yourself, don't buy from Jews. Nazi stormtroopers would stand in front of the uh, Jewish-owned stores, which had either closed, like this one, for fear of being uh, beaten up if you're a store owner. To, uh, but you had people, for example, this woman on the right, who may have said, what are you guys doing? This is my favorite store. What about this image in that year as well. This is a clothiers. You see the words Jew, Yuda, scrawled upon it. So these are the more famous images of the blockade of Jewish shops and the initial attempts to purify the Nazi economy of what the Nazis saw as impure elements that were corrupt, corrosive and corrupting. What's interesting to me is how everyday life, though, as a shopper and consumer might have coincided with uh, the sort of propaganda. So you, as you walk into a clothing store, perhaps this is a department store in Cologne. Um, it used to be known as, as Cohn's, actually, C-O-H-N. You would see the, and then it was taken over. You would see uh, mannequins. You would see, but then you would see things, the Fuhrer for you. Der Führer für euch in the swastika. So in some ways, life continues, but under this uh, veil of, under sort of the watchful eye of the Nazi regime. So when we talk about, and now here I go into a little bit of my research, when we talk about corporate complicity, companies specifically that contributed to the many crimes of Nazism, um, I wanna sort of briefly call up images and logos which you yourselves know. So what companies are we talking about? Well, the three automobile companies from Germany, there are others, of course, but the three most famous, Bavarian Motor Works, or BMW, Daimler-Benz, Mercedes-Benz, and Volkswagen. These were all companies that after 1945 had to explain themselves, had to account for the fact that they uh, used slave labor, that they made war material, that they retooled away from cars and used slave labor. Then of course there's Siemens perhaps, you know, whoops, and Bayer. Uh, let me scroll down a bit here. I'm... So Siemens is the electrotechnical company based in Berlin and now Munich. I think in our daily lives, we see plenty of references to Siemens or ads. Bayer, who entered, they, Bayer invented aspirin in the 19th century, but Bayer was part of the conglomerate called IG Farben, which owned the company that made poison gas and that uh, work, set up a slave labor camp in Auschwitz, known as Auschwitz III, a camp to make 
uh, synthesized rubber, synthetic rubber. This image, we add to it. Some of you know Knorr soup. The Knorr family was tied to the Nazis. We see Knorr products somewhat here in the United States. Certainly I grew up with them, but they're not as widespread as in Germany. Fanta. We like Fanta, but this was a, it was, you, you, you don't want to call it necessarily a Nazi creation, and yet in, in World War II, when syrup from Coca-Cola was blockaded, the Coca-Cola company based in Atlanta was, of course, very popular throughout the interwar years in Germany. Coca-Cola GmbH, the German affiliate, existed. And yet when the, the company was often branded as foreign and thus Jewish, there's nothing that makes Coca-Cola a Jewish product, but in response to the inability to get the syrup, the Nazis developed, or people within the uh, industry developed their own drink called the fantasy drink, the fantasy getränk or Fanta. Um, and I see somebody dialing in. Okay, so this is, um, and of course, I please uh, feel free to, Call me if you can't hear me. I'm just gonna look at Marsha as pause. And can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay, thank you, Marsha. Great. So F Fanta for the racially pure members of society, a drink that will offer them the fantasies of pleasure. Uh, Opal, did I just add Opal? Okay, and that's a subsidiary of an American company, but it was there in Nazi Germany too, General Motors. Uh, subsidiary Opal worked for the war effort. Merck Pharmaceuticals. You get the idea here. It goes on and on. And I'm not trying to do a rogues list per se, but what, what I've discovered is how closely these companies were tied. Tucson Krupp Steel, Hugo Boss. Uh, I wore a Hugo Boss uniform. Uniform slip. <laughs> they made uniforms. I did not wear a uniform. I wore a Hugo Boss suit at my wedding. Hugo Boss, had I known this, I may not have worn it, made the uniforms, some uniforms for the SS, black shirts, and the SA. Hugo Boss, an old family in fashion. Uh, so now that this is being recorded, Phil, I'm in trouble. I did not wear a uniform at my, <laughs> at my, uh, at my wedding. Okay. On we go, uh, BASF, a chemical company, was part of the conglomerate that was at Auschwitz. Some of you might know Dr. Oetker. I don't think you have it that much here, but you'll see it at Aldi in the frozen food section. Aldi is a German company. Let's move on to uh, Bosch Auto Parts. Of course, the most famous does remain, I think, initially the Volkswagen that I showed, which was Hitler's pet car, his idea of building a wagon or car for the people, for the folk, the racially pure folk. Hitler and Ferdinand Porsche unveiled uh, a prototype in 1934. And eventually Germans are asked to save up for the people's car, put money in savings, and then eventually they would get this car, which would be contribute to mass mobility across the network of autobahns and roads in Germany. Um, what uh, an entire factory town is built uh, called uh, Strength Through Joy City, which was responsible for building these. Now, in fact, beyond a few prototypes, this, the VW Beetle or Bug did not actually roll off the assembly lines <coughs> until after World War II because the co company had to retool quickly for, military, for the military. Interesting in enough, when you're looking at how companies <clears throat> have remembered themselves. 1930, the company was founded in 1935. And yet, if you go to the VW store online, at least as of a few years ago, um, you've noticed this interesting product. Now, normally I would say, what do you all see? And of course, this is quite ironic. Established 1949, uh, a little bit, 14 years too late. You might say reestablished, but in fact, that's the company never really disappeared. So it's a nice sort of whitewashing of the Nazi past uh, by claiming that when the Federal Republic of Germany or West Germany was founded four years after World War II, thus Volkswagen came back. 
Other areas that relate to the sort of everyday life of buying and selling and shopping and consuming in the Third Reich has to do with something as mundane as coffee. So what does coffee have to do with this? Well, what I, one of the things I discovered is that the Nazis who were constantly looking for ways of purifying the race using rather unscientific or pseudoscientific ideas about racial purity, they were constantly looking for products that in some manner would lead to higher performance among racially pure Germans, lead them eventually to produce more babies, and, and note I say produce because that's sort of the notion. And coffee, this is just from a Donald Duck cartoon, but more interestingly for me, it's the founder of the first, the, of the decaffeination process, a guy named Ludwig Roselius, who sets up a company called Cafe Hag, uh, Sanka, it's renamed as it's marketed in France to Sanka sans, cafe, sans caffeine, without caffeine. And it's this man, Ludwig Roselius, who along with Nazi leaders start to indicate that decaf coffee is in fact better for the racial body than caffeine. So all sorts of stories come out about how the Nazi, how caffeine will uh, kill you. It's not widespread because in fact, Germans in, in terms of people's response, because Germans crave their coffee, especially during war when they don't have it. But you can see how the ideology of purity gets caught up in the most mundane products. So Cafe Hag, the German version, original name of Senka, is there in stores, in magazines. You could read stories about how Rosalius, the, the patent who pat patented decaffeination uh, methods, how his father died of uh, caffeine poisoning, as he claimed, and that one of the things you must do for the folk is abstain from caffeine. Now, of course, people miss their caffeinated Coke. They, they had to make coffee from Erzatz products. So it leads to the question of how successful the Germans were in uh, branding products as racially pure. Another one was wash, what wash powder, as they call it, or laundry detergent you chose might indicate how committed you are to purity. So the company Perzil, which I start, to, I'm starting to see more and more in the last 10 years on American, in American shops, P-E-R-S-I-L, that's still a hugely popular uh, company. Uh, in Germany, they would market themselves as being help purifying or cleaning the nation. They would have in their employee magazine, they would have political cartoons about Jews or black people, how if you, they, they would show a black person perhaps uh, falling into a tub of uh, perizil and then becoming purified. Uh, they would indicate that this product is the best one you can do to show that you're a clean member of the folk. Now, again, reality on the ground is somewhat different, and I can talk about that later, but this is just an interesting area where you see the kind of vestiges of normalcy, shopping, um, even during war, sort of combined with ideology, which is not unique to Nazi Germany, per se. Just one more, a few more images about Nazi products. Uh, in my own work. This is a company, interestingly, there's a company called Benks, Benkeser um, that owns all of these brands. They, the Benkeser company, it's a holding company. They got most of their money from a family that was very active in Nazi Germany, the Ryman family. And so the question I sometimes ask students, oops, there's a comment here. Hold on, I'm gonna jump in and there's a, let me just see. Sorry about this, I, I don't wanna ignore anybody. Okay. Oh, okay, I, that's probably <laughs> Doug, Douglas Wagner. Oh, I see, no, no, that's a private. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna, sorry about that. I'm gonna close that. Sometimes I'm still using the chair, uh, the chat function. So some of these companies, obviously, the question is how much do you, do with this information 75 years later. Other countries have had companies um, working with their governments. Do we boycott? Certainly some Jewish families have asked 
that they don't receive Krupp kitchen products for weddings or bar mitzvahs, K-R-U-P-S, um, you know, coffee grinders. Now, when I point out to them that in fact, that company has nothing to do with Nazi Germany, that K-R-U-P-P, the famous steel company is what they might be thinking of. They'll say, oh, or they'll say, as my sister said, I don't care if it's one P or two Ps, I'm boycotting it. So somewhat jokingly. And of course, there is still a question too about wh whether companies have made comp uh, has compensated legitimately. Bayer has done so much, as has VW in most of these countries, to uh, companies to pay into funds that support aging survivors of Nazi Germany. It's done a lot. Um, uh, now, forget about the fact that they were the first to patent heroin too. Um, we can put that aside now, but it's interesting. Again, I put that there as an indication, again, of how complex these histories are. And it's not immediately obvious to people whether somehow uh, 85 years after Hitler came to power, 88, 87 years, whether these companies should be boycotted or whether they should keep giving uh, to funds. It's something perhaps we that support uh, Jewish causes or uh, the families of Holocaust victims and survivors, something we can distress, discuss. I'm gonna just quickly look at the time. Okay, I wanna just, so right now I've covered a few themes and I just wanna go briefly uh, for five or 10 more minutes into an area, my most recent area of research. So we've sort of, what I've done so far is give you an overview of the problem, the challenge of keeping Nazism alive, and then we have the, as, as in a scholarly uh, object, of course, not as it's seen sometimes now, neo-Nazism, how we kind of think anew about coercion and consent, how everyday life in a dictatorship looked. But one of the things that I'm got uh, interested in uh, is my new work, which has to do with Nazi views of the Jim Crow South, which is, of course, uh, appropriate, I think, being here and studying it in the South makes it that much more interesting to me. So where did I get this idea? Well, when I was doing work on advertising in German companies, I got a hold of perhaps the most vicious, anti-Semitic, racist newspaper. The collection of them is at many libraries, in this case at the University of Illinois. This was put out by the Nazi racial office, which was in charge of inculcating an, in, uh, racism, racial ideals into the public. Um, and what I found was an ad for Nivea uh, suntan oil. So Nivea was one of the, Nivea was one of the big advertisers. And what was interesting about this is that I was reading along this article here, which was written by a Northern Italian who was arguing that Italians were Aryans, Nordic. They were white in the most pure sense of that Nazi ideology promoted. Because he was fighting back against this notion that Italians are dark and Mediterranean and, and somehow lesser on the scale of humanity. So this particular article says that we Northern Italians from Milan, from Lake Como, we ourselves are white and blonde and Aryan, so don't lump us all together, we Italians. North is very different than South. But what's interesting to me is the juxtaposition of this, advertise, this article with this advertisement, which says, make yourself brown better with Nivea. So, but Bräune means tan. So the word is Bräune, it says Bräune richtig mit Nivea. So literally sort of brown yourself better with Nivea tan oil. And it got me thinking again about sort of these instability and absurdities of the concept of color and race. How one article is saying whiteness is the pure, um, is the reality. But then the readers who might be flipping through this on a vacation, or in their seeing this magazine in their dentist's office might want to be reminded that you're going to get the best beach tan with Nivea cream. So that got me thinking about views of blackness, views of brownness, views of race, 
and then they moved on to much more sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, unified study of Nazi views of uh, no, of uh, Jim Crow South. Now, this is not an entirely new area if you look at how uh, people in Germany in the 30s looked at Black Americans. So, of course, we know Jesse Owens. Uh, we have our Jesse Owens Highway, Jesse Owens in Alabama. 1936 Olympics, Jesse Owens was there and did amazingly in the 36 Summer Olympics in Berlin. Interestingly enough, though, Jesse Owens, despite the myth, says he was not snubbed by Hitler. There was certainly one day where Hitler did not shake the hands of anybody who, any athletes, and that's partly to do with, I think, with what, because there were people like him, Jesse Owens, that notwithstanding, the German public loved him, and he himself said after 1936 that he felt much more welcome in Berlin than in the American South. Uh, we have these images of jazz. The Nazis banned jazz and ragtime, and they banned all forms of black music, all black musical forms, and labeled them as somehow degenerate, black and Jewish. That here, Jewish producers took black people, whom they characterize here in the most grotesque, stereotypical way, and they created this degenerate or antarctica jazz music. Benny Goodman is an example of a Jewish jazz man who kind of combined the worst of what the, in, of America as the Nazis saw it. Um, but what I want to do is uh, simply look more closely. And what, so what I've done is, uh, what I've done is actually look at some areas that are gaining more attention now. For example, how the Nazis wrote about anti-miscegenation or anti-intermarriage laws in the South. And one of the things that's interesting is you find that, for example, Nazis, they studied racial laws, not just in the South, but around the United States, intermarriage laws, when they were devising the laws in 1935 against Jews, which stripped them in, of their citizenship, which defined who a Jew was, which prevented or forbade intermarriage. They actually looked at the not the American one single drop of blood rule, uh, namely that African-American is defined by how you look and by your heritage. So you could be actually very light-skinned, like the head of the NAACP, Walter White, but you would still be Black. The Nazis, in their own way, studied this, disseminated literature, and then came to understand that they needed to design a, a different system, one that they in their own minds thought was less uh, prohibitive, but as we know, that was entirely destructive. One of the areas I'm looking at, I'm looking at in my book, I'm looking at um, some of the comparisons that people have drawn between Nazism and Jim Crow, and this is not a moral comparison, but certainly we have images like this. This is not, says not for Aryans. This is in Germany. And this reminds people sometimes of the laws in South Africa or the American South, the um, Jim Crow laws. Now, it's a very tricky theme because you don't want to, again, say that you're just putting these two regimes side by side. For me, as a German reader, I'm trying to study what the Nazis and what Germans from World War I through the 1960s said about uh, Black people in America. Um, I found a few political art cartoons that I'll show briefly. This is a, this is Nazis hip hypocritically would point to violence in the in America and say, you guys are really the cruel ones. So they sort of show Uncle Sam marked with a Jewish star because in their view, America, the Roosevelt administration was controlled by Jews. Uh, we protest, so Uncle Sam says, against, in the name of humanity, we protest against the barbaric methods of Germany. So how dare this sort of cynically, this our cartoon is saying, how dare the U.S. talk? Now, the Nazis conveniently looked, overlooked their own barbarism, but you'll see that they cite lynching and the death penalty. Um, or in the United States, you'll find African-American newspapers like the Chicago Defender here in the US also drawing links between what they see as hypocrisy. 
So this, uh, you know, in this case, not consciously mimicking, mimicking Hitler, but here black Americans are saying, um, you know, there is brutality in our own backyard. So what do I want to do with this? What do I hope to gain with my, my work it, more broadly? I want to end my meditations here and have a good discussion, but um, I want to uh, keep a sensitivity uh, to the unique horrors of Nazi period in mind, but also place them in a larger context. So uh, I want to understand that the Nazis themselves saw themselves not as the, sing the sole racists in the world, but they saw a world in which they saw, they saw anti-Black racism, anti-Semitism, racism in Japan, racism in South Africa, and they felt that they were on the cutting edge of a project of racial engineering and purification that would eventually take hold and that was already taking hold internationally. Um, where are we today? Well, I'll simply end with a little bit of a sad note, obviously, since Charlottesville, we have seen this sort of regular feature of 1945, post-45 of political culture, which talked about the lessons of Nazism. We've seen it really come to fore much more visibly through people, neo-Nazis organizations being tracked by the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery. We're seeing now something that I don't think any of you thought you might see, or certainly I, which is the presence of Nazi flags, still on the fringe, but simply more than we ever thought, but moving into the mainstream. The presence of uh, this sort of white ethno-nationalism, which is bringing us full, fully to, uh, into the question of comparisons and how to confront the legacy of this period. Um, now, I have no illusions that my particular work will uh, change the way we think about violence or terror, I hope in a modest way, but I do keep looking for new angles. Um, I want to make sure my students and my fellow historians keep our moral and historical compasses in working order. And so to this original question, will the Nazi years pass into history? I would say most assuredly yes but it will be replaced by other themes and other tragedies and hopefully other great moments of heroism that our students this century and beyond can study and learn about. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna open it up now. Let me, I don't know how to un, well, I think you should probably stay muted and then I will try to use the chat function as well. I know that some of you send private chats, some of you send group chats. Let's try to do the, let's hear, try to hear voices maybe first. Marsha, you can still hear me, right? Okay, so maybe what I'm gonna go do is go into gallery mode. Um, wow, there are a lot of people, but maybe I, we can do it. I'll do a speaker mode, I think, where the person talking, let's see, uh, speaker mode, let's take a look. Uh, well, I'll take some questions and hopefully you'll show up. Raise your hand. Hello. Hi, is that Ronald? Yeah, that's me. Hi, Mr. Vinick. My question, uh, how do you see the movement of Antifa, an anti-fascist movement that is currently being uh, utilized or exploited for the benefit of a political party. Do you see that their uh, mission, which is to be opposed to fascism, even to the point of violence, a viable alternative, because they claim that if the actions of people in 1933 Germany were more active, they would have avoided the, the Holocaust and the whole Hitlerian situation? That's a great question. Um, I really like that question. I, I struggle with it because on the one hand, we see this group of people on the right marching in Charlottesville or elsewhere. On the other hand, you see this loose sort of coalition of people known as anti-fascists or Antifa or Antifa, anti-fascists, who are also engaging in looting and, and, and violence. 
But what is, I, I think rather than sort of staking a claim on, you know, whether they're equivalent or making a point on that, it is what's fascinating and disturbing to see is how they play into political agendas. And that is very much reminds me of 1932, the final years of the Nazi, of the pre-Nazi Republic, when communists were fighting in the streets against fascists or Nazis. Now, the Antifa, I am still sort of trying to figure out whether Antifa is the sort of leaderless movement that has, that has a few uh, rogue elements or whether it's developing into something more like an actual a counter movement that um, is a terrorist organization as the president has branded it. I mean, most people who study this uh, right now see Antifa as a much tinier threat than than uh, far right movements. I will say though that what Antifa bases its ideology on is the idea that in 1933, as you say, Mr. Vinick, that in 1932 and 1933, the left didn't fight hard enough. So in fact, in every free election, the Nazis never attained as much as many votes at the, in the ballot box as the two parties of socialists and communists received combined. So there is this sense that, you know, the socialists who were fairly mainstream should have combined with the, uh, and the communists in an anti-fascist coalition and that Nazism wouldn't have happened if, the, if people had fought harder. And so that's kind of the lesson that Antifa people pose. Um, whether or not they're going to grow as a sort of destructive force that um, I just don't, I can't say. Um, the bigger, of course, the amount of violence in 1932 which poured into the streets of the biggest uh, cities and small towns doesn't even compare to now, which is it's isolated to some cities. Lots. That's a good question. Put me on the spot a little, but not doesn't have to really. All right. Uh, I see somebody. Let me check the chat while you. Let's look at chat. Okay. No, nothing. Oh, turn off share screen. I, uh, yes, I will. Turn off share screen. Um, it's off, I believe. Any other questions? I've got one. Um, as somebody who grew up in the South, I think I probably share some sentiments with uh, the Germans these days in that it becomes weary after a while hearing over and over and over and over and over all the bad things that happen, particularly as we get farther and farther away from it. I don't have any reservations about the bad things that happen and lessons that should be learned, but I wonder, is there historically a time when that changes or does it stay active forever and, and uh, how do you resolve it? Great question. It's such a key question in German society today. And I guess with uh, all of the uh, momentum now about the uh, confronting uh, the Confederate legacy and monuments, but I will say, uh, let me speak to Germany first. So um, one can argue that Germany is probably the most successful country in coming to terms with its past, talking about the past. So there would be people who would say, Germans, they have never acknowledged what they're doing, what they did. And of course, that's simply not true. They've built an entire democracy on memory, whether it be when you walk through cities, you see memorials to the Holocaust victims, the homosexual victims of Hitler, to gypsies or Roma. You see places where Jews were taken from their homes. And I have some examples of monuments. And school textbooks, really, since the 1970s, have involved learning about the crimes of National Socialism. These are Germans both coming to terms with their own past and responding to pressure to acknowledge. Now, m the problem, and this is what you're hinting at, is I think there is inevitably, especially as time goes past, a backlash. So the question is, how long does Germany have to, quote unquote, pay for its sins? Now, as a point of fact, you can argue that Germany is possibly, it's the most successful exporting country in the world. It's one of the richest countries in the world. It has a vibrant democracy, a high standard of living. So 
they're doing okay. We shouldn't necessarily feel sorry for them. And a lot of Germans feel that they can combine a kind of the constant memory of their crimes with, with this kind of Germany because things are really darn good in Germany. I've lived there many years. However, young people, they grow tired of learning about it in middle school, in high school, in college. Is there a negative effect to having to encounter monuments to, to German shame all the time? I think the answer to your question is that it happens somewhat organically, that other countries, certainly uh, Germany's allies, don't really hold it to task anymore, Germany to task anymore. We scholars do because we keep teaching about this period, but I think as more and more survivors die out, as more perpetrators die out, there won't be any more trials. There will be an attempt, certainly as Germany continues to place, do very successful economically into its seventh decade after World War II, it's going to be able to sort of claim more spaces of pride. The German flag came out during the World Cup several years ago and hasn't left. The South is another question too. I'm new to the South. And for me, I'm of course intrigued by all of these discussions because they remind me so much of what's played out in Germany, namely the question of how much do you memorialize? How much do you apologize? What do you think? Uh, I, I have a comment. Uh, okay. he, since you've lived in Germany, I, I read Yasha Monk's uh, book, Stranger in My Own Country. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. I have not read it. Oh, you have it. Well, you know, he grew up in Germany and he lived in a, a, a medium sized city. And uh, one of the reactions he relates in his book is of how when he identified himself as being a Jew, that no one had, none of his classmates were even aware that there were any Jews in Germany at this point. You know, they were all sort of, they laughed because they didn't know that there were. And uh, I just find it interesting that uh, I, I was reading a review in the New York Times the other day about this book by uh, Volker Ulrich on downfall. And, and I noticed here the quote here, without Hitler, there would have been no Holocaust but then adds that without, without thousands of accomplices, there could have, been no, could have been no Holocaust. Has things changed as much as we might like to think in Germany or not? I, I know I've been to Germany, and I think it's a wonderful place in many regards, but wow, uh, this history, I mean, Hitler wasn't the one that made all the bad things happen, in, and I'm not defending Hitler here. No, I mean, I think part of what I was talking about was the sort of broader question of, the, the sort of layers and circles of complicity. And so you're absolutely right that there's that question of Germans who bought into it. We now know, to sort of answer my own question earlier, Germans really did, you look at their letters, their diaries, Germans really very, were very excited about, most Germans about uh, what was going on. Full employment, travel opportunities. Of course, they didn't want a second world war and they didn't all approve of Hitler's anti-Semitism. People came to, uh, in the 30s with as many contradictions and constellations of views as we do. You may like some things a president does and other things you don't like. You might not like somebody personally as a leader, but think he's doing well other ways. Um, in terms of this question of how far we've come, Germany is quite amazing. I mean, it's almost, I say as a Jewish American sometimes that, wow, it's almost, isn't this almost too much memory? a surfeit of memory, perhaps they say. I mean, I will say this, that, uh, that your comment about not knowing Jews is interesting. Now, of course, since the collapse of world, of the uh, communism, a lot of Soviet, former Soviet Jews have moved to Germany. There are actually a lot of Israelis who are in Germany now. Um, yeah, I mean, if you, you'll find a lot of people who've never met uh, Jews. One of the interesting things, though, is that there's sort of, you might call it a fetishes, fetishizing of things Jewish. At least in the 90s when I lived there, there would be sort of this sense like, oh my gosh, you're Jewish. I love Jews. Um, and, and you find very bizarre things like, you know, German men who will only date Jewish women. It's sort of exotic. You know, sorts of all sorts of patterns of that. that. I mean, one thing that bothers my German Jewish friends and that they're used to is that some of the traditional stereotypes about Jews are still used. 
uh, but in a pro-Jewish way, or instead of anti-Semitic, philo-Semitic. For example, you'll get Germans, and this is caricatured a little bit, they'll say, I love Jews. I love that they're good with money and control Hollywood. You know, <laughs> that's a good thing. And, you're, and so my German Jewish friends think that it's kind of the same cliches, but they're flipped on their head. So, and that can often happen in the absence of Jews. Um, in any case, these are great questions. Maybe very briefly, I'll, I'll save it. I do have a few slides about the, mem the work of memory, as you call it. But I think that Germany has changed a lot. Unfortunately, we're now seeing um, some neo-Nazi movements getting stronger within the German military today. Other thoughts, questions? I see Marsha. But you have to unmute Marsha. Some of the Holocaust uh, victims who are still alive today look around what's happening in the United States and they say that this, they see some of the things happening here that happened in Germany. Yeah. And it's frightening to them yeah. because this is almost a replay of what they went through. Yeah. It's really scary. I mean, I'm reading the German press right now and I'm seeing them reflect very much on that. And it's not just um, uh, Germans, but of course, some Americans are wondering about the same thing. So there, it, so one of the things you can do is draw parallels, but will it end in the same place? So for example, some people will say that uh, make America great again is similar to what the Nazi party said, make Germany, essentially Germany needs to be made great again. Others will people say, say well, that's a kind of standard a trope, a standard phrase in a populist, uh, in, the, in a populist vocabulary. So uh, are we stretching it too much? One thing that I think is certainly my German friends are constantly freaking out about and, and texting me about is like, oh, this concept of fake news. Well, that's what they used to say about uh, germ uh, uh, news coming from non-Nazi sources. They would say it's, it's fake. They're, they see some elements of, they see the marching, they see Charlottesville and with Nazi flags, and they say, what is happening? So there's a tremendous sense of anxiety. And as a point of fact, because uh, things, because Nazi literature is banned in Germany, you can go to jail for actually selling and buying Nazi literature. It's now easier on the web. A lot of people would get their a lot of neo-Nazis in Europe would get their literature from the US where we have freedom of speech laws. So places like in Nebraska and Idaho, they would print out since the 1970s, most of the neo-Nazi stuff and they would make their way abroad. But, you know, I'm almost, it's interesting now, I'm a historian of Nazi Germany, living in 2020, hearing my own students' concerns. They, I'm not telling them to feel or think it's the same way, but I'm uh, in a particular way, but they are saying, wow, look at this uh, double speak or look at some of the things that are happening in the United States. They are very nervous. So students of history, again, there's an opposing view that says that both, that there, there are not, the parallels are too flimsy. Um, but I can tell you that I taught my class last night. Uh, it's a class in modern Germany and Nazi Germany and not a few students worried that uh, in January of 19, of 2021, we will resemble Germany more than they have ever imagined. So I'm not, I'm not pro proclaiming things from my, uh, from my uh, lectern. I'm simply hearing students who are worried about democracy in the United States. I see Sandra Vinnick. Yes, yes. my question. Sounds mundane compared to this philosophical discussion, but we as a Holocaust surviving family have been very careful to abstain from buying any of those products, many of those products, which you displayed, and so we have never bought German cars and any product that we knew because we think it's important as a memory and to pass on to our children, our grandchildren and children need to know what this family stands for. As you have pointed out, 
it's more nuanced now than it was when we were kids because now we're finding out that there are products that have made reservations to um, condone. Is there a source that you have or a book that can inform us as to which are the products that we can use to make a stand still? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I would, there is not a single book. I don't, what I, what I can do is send you some things where I think, actually, I, what, I, what I can do is, I think the best way of getting at this is actually going to a website, which I can send you. Uh, it's, it's the foundation established in 1999 uh, by German companies. It's called uh, sort of the, the foundation remembrance responsibility. I, I can send a link, but I'll Thank post you. But what that does is it shows every company that's paid into this fund, companies that, that, that can help uh, uh, survivors of national socialist crimes and Nazi crimes. And, but the reality is, and this doesn't answer your question about a, the list, but every German company that we can think of that was around in the 1930s did something closely with the regime, which has led people them to say after 45 that we had no choice, which is not exactly true. What they saw was opportunities to take property from Jews, opportunities to exploit concentration camp and death camp labor. But what's interesting about this, so I can send you that link, but what's interesting about this, I think as, I, as a teacher is whether something like, what is the, an ABA can ask you, what is the statute of limitations maybe for a, a boycott? For example, do, and I myself have not bought, a lot of these products I try not to buy either, at least growing up we didn't as well, but the question becomes sort of, do you, do you, not, do you into the 2020s or 2030s, do you try and tell your kids not to buy bear products and buy an, another aspirin. You know, these are kind of interesting choices. Now, as consumers, we have that power and it's a little something we can do. But the question, but the companies are banking on the fact that they make enough money and people will forget. But I'm gonna make a note to get your email, Ms. Vinick and, okay. Other questions, perhaps, thoughts? I recently picked up a uh, New York New York Times uh, book review that reads as follows: uh, <clears throat> the impulsiveness and grandiosity, the bullying and vulgarity, were obvious from the beginning. And he goes goes on. The review goes on to say that he never issued a written order. He didn't need to. He preferred to traffic the generalities making his wishes known so that his careerist minions could figure out the rest with the method that allowed him to feed his vanity while preserving the option to among the others. Aren't there extraordinary parallels here between Hitler, who was the subject of this third volume book by Ulrich, and the present occupant of the White House? You know, I, when I, I read the same Folko Ulrich review that the two of you read in New York Times, and of course you can tell uh, can Mr. Down. Long that that's clearly it was written with the sense of irony, the sense of the parallels. I mean, it's, it's striking to me. Again, I'm sort of, what's interesting about teaching in this field is you come into your classroom and you sort of are told, you know, don't go down that road, let the students go down that road. And of course, I'm letting my students go down that road. What's interesting about it is that that's, a, let's focus on the Hitler component for now. I mean, that's absolutely accurate. Hitler, there was no written order. People, he surrounded himself with sycophants. He pushed out those who didn't uh, say yes to him. And they began to anticipate his needs. It was called working toward the Fuhrer, where one, depart, one um, party functionary would try to outdo the other in extreme um, measures to try to please and feed the vanity of um, um, the, the leader. So your question about the parallels is a provocative one. And I, I see them, I see them. Whether or not you know the narcissism that you might see on display in different settings, whether it will sort of lead to 
uh, the same results, God forbid, is another question. But certainly one is sort of reeling when you study this period. You're reeling from some of the at least superficial parallels and the kind of things that, for example, that you find in a kind of narcissistic personality. Was that, was that safe enough? <laughs> oh, that's safe enough. <laughs> <laughs> Not really that safe, but you know. Well, but I'm, in all seriousness, I'm very careful. We have to be careful, obviously, to the health history is there to both worry about and learn and people are scared now whether or not again history uh, repeats itself or whether it simply rhymes whatever that means people have all sorts of cliches or whether you so if you don't study the past you're condemned to repeat it the problem is if you do study the past sometimes you're condemned to repeat it so we can sort of move yes. through areas of concern but it does take some careful nuance and then certainly um, for example, through the Birmingham Holocaust Education Center, I've heard very vocally, and I don't know, um, Ms. Vinnick, if you're part of that, but I've heard some survivors talk very openly about how scared they are now, or how familiar it seems. Another question, more of a military uh, nature. I've been reading Nigel Hamilton's uh, books on Churchill and Roosevelt. And uh, he says that in 1941, after his, Hitler decided to abrogate his treaty with the Soviets and invade Russia, that the Russian, that the German military uh, heads knew that that was a war, that that was their, the end of an opportunity uh, to conduct a war that they would win. Uh, is that uh, borne out in your research? Yeah, that's borne out. I mean, that I think one one's tended to want to do the following in the military history for a long time. They would say two things: when was the actual turning point? When did Germany? When did Germany? When was the cause lost? And then the second one, question, sort of relatedly, was when did they know it was lost? And I think you have it's perhaps waves of suspicion amongst the generals, and then hope. So none of the generals thought when. Hitler was ready for a war in 1939. They didn't want him to. Um, they didn't want him to start one. But he got rid of those people. Or and then when the victories came, they said, "Okay, maybe he's a genius." And then in the summer of 1940, after he defeated uh, the Western European, Northern European powers, they said, "Okay, that's good enough." And people were desperate to not have him invade the Soviet Union. They thought, and I think that the reality of that is that. It, was probably lost. But then when he got close to Moscow, they said, well, wait a minute, maybe we can do this. Then he turns his armies inexplicably south, and then it's seen as really finished. So I think the interesting question, too, is why people fought on for three more, four more years. But I think that, to answer your question, yes, it is borne out. Was, was the, uh, as, as Hamilton cites the, uh, uh, abandonment of the German offensive at Kursk and moving uh, moving German troops to Italy as being a, a, a military turning point. Is that? Uh... Yes, yes. I'm not a military historian. I don't know that much, but certainly that's cited as is, of course, the turning of troops southward away from Moscow. But I think Kursk is a, a, a turning point. Again, um, you know, just because it's in hindsight, the battle is lost doesn't mean that they didn't hope for three years that they could make a final push, but that, um, but I think that's correct. I think that's correct. Right. Uh, Dr. Dr. Beeson, I, uh, since we two of us have mentioned this, this one book uh, by Ulrich, and uh, a friend of mine was telling me how he was reading the second volume of Richard Evans' book about the trilogy on German. Do you have any other than your own book, do you have any book or books in particular that you would suggest for someone that was interested in reading about it? I know there have been a lot of them written. Uh, yeah, I would. Of course, Richard Evans, is his trilogy is wonderful. Um, I have not read the Focal Ulrich biographies yet. I've read Ian Kershaw's biographies, K-E-R-S-H-A-W. But I think the magisterial works still are by an Israeli historian who has taught at UCLA and in Israel for most of his career. He's a man named Saul Friedlander, Fried, R-I-E-D, Lander. I'll type it 
right here in the messages. He wrote, um, I think the most elegant trilogy, or I think it maybe it's two books, uh, studies of Nazi Germany, which does this amazing job of not taking the perspective of the perpetrator or the machinery of killing or Jews themselves, but combines them all. He's able to do this kind of pastiche of voices from Jews, voices from other oppressed people, and the voices of uh, people from throughout Nazi society, and is able to tell the story in two wonderful volumes about sort of how Germany looked in those 12 years from multiple angles. I would always recommend Saul Friedlander's two, two volumes. Yes. Thank you for that suggestion. Uh, I, I know there there may be some other people that have a question. Uh, we I, I guess we could stay with this for a good while. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to make a comment or have a question for Dr. Reason? Okay. Well, in that I case, I can show some. I maybe if you want, I can show a couple more things. But that would be fine. All right, well, and this really gets to some of the earlier questions, so I think I will share the screen. And um, this one, by the way, is, let me just share my screen again. Let's see. Um, all right. Um, all right, so this is just so you, uh, this is just another publication that we came out in the 1930s in a new, in a newspaper called the Pittsburgh Courier, which is uh, an app, one of the key chief African American uh, newspapers. Which I'm not okay. seeing your share of screen yet. Maybe we just let me try again. Um, ah, now now it works. So this is. So these kind of, what, what's interesting about this is that uh, even at the time and still today, some people who were deeply affected by the Holocaust would find this unfair. But if you're an African-American writing in the 30s, who doesn't yet know necessarily of what's to come, you would see resonances. So I find this interesting, this sort of dialogue between the U.S. Uh, and the, in Germany, this kind of who's worse discussion uh, up until at least 1938, when Kristallnacht affected so many Jews. I think that's sort of interesting. I want to get back to this theme, though, of memory and how much... Now, I personally think, to answer an earlier question more directly, I do think that Germany, uh, both for its own sake, but also for the sake of future generations, has to keep memorializing. And there, there can't be too much memory. Certainly, some young Germans are pushing against it and older Germans. But I think that for the most part, people I know in my generation or younger, um, they think that it's a good thing. Um, and one of the more interesting monuments, I don't know if anybody has been to Berlin, but in the 1980s, uh, people woke up in a, an area of Western Berlin, actually in the 90s, uh, an area called the Bavarian Quarter to find signs everywhere. So there's your regular street sign. And up here is a sign on of just a picture. But on the back of numerous pictures, like this one, it says Jews in groups of 20 people or larger are forbidden from going hiking. The 10th of July, 1935. So what this artist did is to try to integrate the proclamations of which there were thousands against German Jews in the 1930s and 40s into the everyday life of Berliners in this area. So you can't go down the street now in the Bavarian Quarter without seeing a sign like this. Um, and on the back it says, Jewish children may not attend public schools anymore. The 15th of November, 1938, Jews are forbidden from attending schools altogether. 20 June, 1942. By that time, there were many, many German Jews had already been sent to their deaths. Um, 
And so um, originally it didn't even have the sign under here, which points it out as a memorial. So people were outraged and confused when these signs went up. Now, of course, it indicates that these dozens and dozens of signs are um, part of the everyday landscape. So most people have come to uh, understand why they're there, but then there are those people in the Bayerische Viertel, the Bavarian Quarter who say, why do we have to look at this all the time? Kind of like, why are we reminded all the time? Can't we normalize ourselves as a nation, acknowledge our crimes, but not have to live with it? So it's a debate. Another one, which I think may, some of you may also know about is this so-called stumbling stones or Stolpersteine, where all around Germany, beginning in Berlin, um, the houses of Jews were identified where they lived and people could sponsor, if you're a Holocaust survivor or a concerned citizen, sponsor the tapping into the sidewalk of a memorial that you stumble upon, like a, called stumbling stones. And this is where I lived. The Hirschberg family was deported. Uh, they lived here. Inga Hirschberg was born in 1933, murdered in Auschwitz. So she was a young girl. Charlotte Her Hirschberg, born 1903, murdered in Auschwitz. And so the idea is you can't get away from history. Again, though, people are arguing that um, it's too much, that uh, you should not have to face this. So you, these, these stones are vandalized. Uh, Brian Stevenson got his some of his ideas about moving monuments to the various places where lynching took place. Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative down in Montgomery, he got his ideas from Germany in part. He talks about that. But then there are concerns too. Do counties, if Jefferson County puts up a monument to the victims of slavery in Lynn Park, will it be defaced? Do people want to be reminded? These are all practical questions. In any case, I will unshare, but that's a kind of issue I think is also central to our understanding of where we go now. Uh, I have one other comment to make, and that was is in my one and only trip to Berlin, I was struck by the incredible contrast of staying in an apartment on Wilhelmstrasse, which was the very a street in which all the Nazi uh, offices were located and they put signs in front of the building even explaining this and going in, in in the back of this very apartment building which was just down the street from the Holocaust Memorial I might add was a large plaque in the parking lot which I at first didn't quite understand until I realized there were a bunch of high school students that were being talked to, and this was where the Hitler bunker was located. And it, it just sort of was seemed bizarre in a way, you know, to be in such a surreal location as to, you know, experience this. I have to say, I've never been in, I think, in a historically significant area as much as being in that very street and place in Berlin. Yeah, it's very powerful, very eerie. I remember when that place was unmarked. It was right near a bunch of apartment blocks. It was in that area of my, near Potsdam or uh, Plotz. And, and then you realize as you stumble upon it, as, as you say, that um, you find that this sort of there you are standing on this place where so much evil was uh, conducted, where so many people were hurt, and you sort of don't know what to do with it. And the big fear, of course, is that neo-Nazis will come and make this a, a rite of passage to come there. That hasn't really happened too much, but they're having this problem now with Hitler's old birth house in, Vienna, uh, in Austria, in a small town. You know, uh, some people want to turn it into a museum. The woman who lived there finally got rid of it and sold it to the state. Other people want to just tear it down. I think they're going to tear it down, ultimately. I have to follow up on that because they don't want it to be a, a place of worship and uh, and monuments for people who are neo-Nazis. But right, you, it, and this is the nature of living in Germany, you kind of hap upon these places. Um, and in some ways, um, again, it poses the question, how much is too much? I think Germans can handle, have handled a lot of this, but they say, I think incorrectly, that it was only 12 years, but boy, what a horrible 12 years it was.
Um, but where we see sort of historical monuments on the sides of buildings down in downtown Birmingham, almost a lot of those will be either about an earlier phase in German history of letters and arts and poets, Goethe and Schiller, or they'll be about the Nazi period. So um, Germans know that Nazism is good tourism too. So we want tourism dollars, every country does. Um, the question is, does that, is that cynical? I don't think so in Germany. I mean, I think that, I don't know if any of you can comment on this, but I've heard that tourism is actually quite robust or had been in Montgomery with the uh, two museum, the Legacy Museum and the Memorial to Peace and Justice. Does that make it crass? I don't, I don't think so, but there are people who say enough of the uh, Holocaust industry, enough of the Shoah business, Shoah the Hebrew word. I lost you, Phil. Do we have further questions or comments or? Okay. Dr. Beeson, we certainly appreciate you coming in and speaking to us this morning. I certainly found it to be very uh, historically significantly interesting. Uh, and uh, thank you again. And we maybe hope that you might make another appearance sometime with us. Well, thank you for your uh, welcoming uh, me and thanks for your wonderful questions. I just want to see one more thing. There may be just one more message of, of thanks. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Marsha and uh, everyone else. So um, I will send you this uh, video when I get it, when it comes to me in my inbox. And I'm always happy to talk to you in the future. Hopefully you'll find a, a place for me in your schedule. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you.